Hello and welcome to part three of the Raylib 2D challenge. Now in part two, I mentioned that the code was starting to get a little complex and was getting to the point where it was really a good idea to restructure it. So rewrite it with some architecture to it, some structure so that it's more understandable and you can use it to actually maybe actually build a game or an application rather than uh, just a tech demo. Because if you keep working too much with the code the way it was, you'd quickly end up with a mess. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. And to, to do that, I'm going to start by switching from C to C++. Now you might be wondering why switch to C++? Uh, the biggest reason is really because that's, that's what I know and that's my preferred tool right now. If I had learned Rust, which is something I'm hoping to do, the Rust language, then I'd probably use Rust. But for now, especially as I, I, I don't have time to learn another language, learn new tools and, and deal with those problems, C++ it is. Now there are two reasons why C++ over C in this situation. You can, you can write all of this in C, but C++ has object-oriented programming. You can operate a, at a higher level of abstraction. And again, you can do it all in C, but you end up having to write more code to do the same thing. And the other thing that I, I am taking advantage of is C++ has, ob objects have destructors and they get called automatically at the end of an object's lifetime. And there are also things like smart pointers and, and so forth. So I can use that to ease the burden of things like memory management, keep track of everything and avoid certain kinds of bugs like uh, memory leaks without having to do too much work. So with that out of the way, let's get started. Let's have a look at the code. To get started quickly, I've taken the make file from Raymond's own game template, uh, which is worth looking at. If you're, if you're going to take the make file like I did, just as a, it's like a quick way to start, uh, also take a peek at his template code, just to see how, how he structured things. Anyway, I've taken that to, so I can get started quickly. I don't have to write my own uh, make file, because in life you do not get extra points for writing everything yourself. So it's good, a good idea to get moving. So likewise, Rob Loach has written this great uh, C++ wrapper for Raylib. And again, to avoid having to write all this low level code when somebody else has done, has done it for you, I've taken his uh, Raylib CPP library and imported it into my project so I can get moving with the actual game code or replication code or whatever it is that we're going to turn this into. Let's have a look at the code itself. So on the left, this is the original game code. And on the right, you see the new main fun uh, file. And the first thing that you should notice is that the new main is a lot shorter. On the left, we've got, I've tried to structure it, but we've got all sorts of code all over the place. This main on the right, nice and clean and focused. So we've got a show error and exit function for when something goes wrong. That basically prints the error message on screen so the user knows what went wrong and then waits until they want to close. And down below that, main is now short and sweet and focused entirely on two things. One, initialization. So you've got, it, it opens the window, sets up the audio. Uh, we create an input handler to read the user input from the keyboard and gamepad, and then it loads our Scarfy scene and enters the main game loop. So that's the second thing that it does. So the main game loop, uh, let's have a look at the original one. Main game loop does exactly the same thing, but this one is way longer and harder to follow. This one, you can see, while the window shouldn't close, we read input from the user and send it through to the current scene. Next, the current scene is updated. So that's the physics simulation and game logic. And what I've done here, because Scarfy's most, the most likely kind of game that you could imagine for this would be a, a platform game. Right? And they're usually episodic. You go through multiple levels. And then, well, the, the title screen is like a scene and you can have a credits scene. Uh, so basically the way this works to make it nice and, nice and clean in the main game loop, if the current scene has come to an end, it can return a next scene, in which case the main game loop will initialize 
the next scene, load up all the, the files it needs. And then the final step is to draw. So this is the basic game loop. Read input from the user, run the physics and game logic, draw. This is the way that you'd like all, well, all your code if you could, but as much as possible, you'd like your code to look like this. Clean, short, focused on one or two things. Let's start digging in. So the input handler contains the code to read the, uh, read the keyboard and the gamepad. In this situation, I've used what's called a command pattern or a, a variation thereof. Um, there's, a, there's a good book called Game Programming Patterns, which I, I recommend you check out. You can buy the book or he's gracefully allowed you to read it online. So anyway, the, I'm using a variation of the command pattern, which as you can see on, on the, uh, in the book itself, they use the command pattern for reading the user input, which is exactly what I'm doing. Uh, what's nice about it is you create this interface. I, I call it command listener that has the commands that the user can send by pushing buttons on the, the gamepad or the keyboard or, or even the mouse or something like that. Um, it's very clear what each of them are. Go up. You, I'm sure you can guess what that is. Go left, go right, go down. I can completely change. The, the, this is hardwired to use the up, down, left, right keys and also A, W, D, S, D and the gamepad buttons uh, for these things. But you could make this completely configurable for those gamers who are really particular about uh, which keys do what and have their own custom setup. You could change it in this input handler and not have to make any changes anywhere else. So that's the input reading done in its own separate model, module, sorry. That gets sent through to the scene. Now, if you think about the, the name scene, go to theater, movies, a scene is a place where action occurs. So the scene in our game is a generic class for any place where action occurs. It might have multiple actors, it's got a player avatar because obviously the player is controlling one person. If you are creating a multiplayer game, you might have multiple player avatars. But in my case, you know, there's one Scarfy, one player avatar. We've got actors. Um, in a more fully fledged scene, you'd probably have a background and also static props. For example, in a platform game, you've got the platforms, so you've got the ground. Um, I haven't added that because I'm basically reworking a scene that just has a white background. Now let's dig into that code and have a look at what it looks like. So the scene, the scene class handles the update. So it does its physics simulation, which basically means when something moves, you update its position. You get gravity to act downward. Here's the gravity, you get gravity to act downward on something until it hits the ground. So we have basically have two objects in our scene right now. We've got the player. Actually, the, the, this code is generic enough. You could have multiple things, but you've got the players, the actors, and you've got the ground. And when they hit the ground, they stop falling. And then the scene draws the background, which in our case is this slightly off-white, so slightly grayish white and then the actors are drawn on top of it. Let's move on to the actors. So the actors are also a command listener. And the reason I've done that is, let's say we don't want to control Scarfy, but we want to control, I don't know, a dog. scarfy has got a, a pet dog. You might want to be able to control that one. All you need to do is a, it's a one line change to change the player avatar from Scarfy to the dog and you're done. And the other thing is that this also allows artificial intelligence code, AI code, to control different actors. Because, well, it's, it's unless you've got a game that is purely multiplayer, you're going to need computer controlled characters. So the actor again has an update, update method on it. And this update method is not to do the physics. This one is to update which frame of animation. For example, let's switch to the demo. You've got Scarf, he's got different frames of animation which make up his walking. Okay. So this allows the actor to update which, which animation is currently being shown. Draw is pretty self-explanatory, that draws the, the actor on screen. 
And this get bounding box is the key to our physics code, our very simple physics code. The bounding box is basically a small rectangle around Scarfi, indicating this is, this is the area where he is. And you can use that to check if any object has collided with Scarfi. So if we switch back to the scene code, you've got it right here. See the, the update code gets the actor's bounding box and then checks if the what's the distance between the bottom of the actor and the ground. And if the distance is negative, meaning we're below, below or sorry, not just negative, negative or equal to zero, then we know we've hit the ground. And we need to do the less than or equal to because our, our physics simulation is done iteratively in, in steps. And it's quite possibly that possible that between one step and the next, an object moves a little bit too far. So we catch that here. And then, yeah, if, if the character's on the ground, stop falling. Stop falling and move the actor so that the bottom of the actor is on the ground. And otherwise, things keep on falling under the influence of gravity. And here we, we call the update method on the actor to update the animation. We can now move on to the code that's specific to Scarfy. So we have our Scarfy scene, which is a very simple one. Look, you can see that with all the code that we've put in scene and, and, and actor here, the Scarfy scene is basically this. We load our Scarfy character. We put Scarfy on the ground in the middle of the screen. We tell the scene, our player avatar is Scarfy, and we add Scarfy to the list of actors. And that's the Scarfy scene done. Yeah, nice and clean that we can do this. If we want to have a different scene with a different character, it would be very easy to copy and change this code. And Scarfy is hardwired because uh, we don't have any data files saying where the frames are yet. Uh, that's something that should come later to make the code more generic and more reusable for different characters. But right now, Scarfy basically loads the Scarfy image and the sound effects, sets up the animation frames, and then you can see here all the, the animation code that was mixed in with other things in the game loop here has all been moved in here. More compact, more easy to, to see what you need to change if you need to change anything. Drawing Scarfy is two-line operation. We need to find out where the top left corner is of Scarfy, and then we draw Scarfy, the current frame, to the screen. And I think the last thing we can look at is here is the command or the, the, the user control handling code. So very simple. You can see if, if up is pushed and Scarfy's on the ground, then we change the y velocity to, to jumping upwards. We've got similar code for going left and going right. We also have this, this might be a bit funny for some people, go nowhere. So if, if left, right, up or down are not pushed, then this method's called and Scarfy comes to a halt. And once we've done that, we have the original demo recreated. So, after all that work, what do we have? Well, at a surface level, uh, no real change. It's the same demo that we had in part two. But underneath, we have the code well organized. There's a structure to it. Things are in different modules, different files, each with their own particular role. The functions are focused on particular, whatever it is that function has to do. So everything is, is understandable. If we need to work on a particular area, we can find it and work on it. And this is the key to being able to create something more complex, like a full-on game or an application. Now, if, if you don't quite get it, imagine taking the source code of something like as complex as a web browser, sticking it all in one file, and then trying to edit it. Uh, you'll find that's pretty much impossible. Nobody can keep everything in their head all the details keep track of everything to be able to, to do that, which is why we need to structure the code. Uh, obviously, we're not done. And there's more work on the, the underlying framework needed before we can create even a, a proto game. 
Uh, but that's for some other time. So that's it for now. I will see you next time.